everybody. You are in for a special treat today. I know you hear me say that a lot, but today is extra special because we're going to go down some really fascinating pathways and Bob's going to share some of the latest research on ranties and platelet activation. And you know, Bob, from some of my other interviews, I will actually formally introduce him once again in just a minute or two, but first some housekeeping. Um, if you want more information, um, you can visit my website, jillcarnahan.com. We have literally 10 years of almost weekly articles. So loads and loads and loads of information. They're all free um, for you to read and peruse and share with uh, your friends, family, or if you're a physician, share with your patients. Sometimes I get other doctors who say, yeah, can I use your you know, blogs as handouts? And I don't mind you share those away. I, I love it. I love the information for me, just like Bob today. I know one of our passions in life is just bringing great information. And we actually get a thrill out of studying and learning. So we're, we're the weirdos. We're the nerds. I was the kind of nerd in my class that really loved to read and study and learn. So here you are two nerds today going on platelet activation. I'm super excited. Um, if you want products, sometimes we talk about products and services, and you can find all of those at uh, drjillhealth.com. And then as you well know, we're over a hundred episodes on YouTube. You can subscribe there. And actually, if you do, that would help me out. Give me a review or you can find us on audio on anywhere you listen to podcasts. So Stitcher and iTunes and uh, Spotify, you name it. You can find all of our episodes there. Um, and we'll try to make this friendly for those auditory listening, Bob. So if there's some slide, we're going to do slides, which I know you all love to see, but we'll try to read a few little details. So if you're just listening by audio and not seeing the video, you'll maybe be able to follow along as as well. Now, just a warning, we're going to dive deep. We like to go deep into the physiology. So don't worry if it's over your head, there will be some takeaway points. Bob's so good at bringing about kind of the basics, but I know a lot of other doctors, practitioners, healthcare professionals listen to us on this podcast. So for those of you who want to go deep, you're going to go deep today. So let me introduce my friend, Bob. I have to tell you a funny story. You may have heard me say this before, but um, one day I was texting Bob, getting ready for our interview. And I just audio text like we do. And it said, Hey babe, when's our, when <laughs> time are we getting on? <laughs> So then the last time we had a conference and I sometimes get the honor of introducing Bob, I told the whole audience, babe, you know, his, his nickname is babe. So, Hey babe. And <laughs> good morning. And great to see you today. And then the whole audience at the conference, I think you got a lot of, Hey babes, right, Bob. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so we love to joke and laugh about that. And um, so that was very funny and the name is a little bit stuck. So sometimes um, that's how Siri goes anyway, without, um, Further ado, Bob Miller is a traditional naturopath specializing in the field of genetic specific nutrition. He's earned his naturopathic degree at Trinity School of Natural Health and is board certified through the ANMA. In 93, he opened Tree of Life practice and served as traditional naturopath for 25 years. For the past several years, he's been engaged exclusively with nutritional genetic variants and related research and specializing in nutritional support for those with chronic Lyme disease. And as we'll talk today, many other chronic infections and toxic triggers. Bob, I just wanna say, I always love having you on because it, it stimulates my learning. I learn new things. We go back and forth and often be like, oh, I'm seeing this in practice. Do you think this relates? So literally in real time, I feel like often we're making great discoveries. I feel like one of the things you're leading us is um, with your background and pathways, you can really pull these together. And you've got a team of researchers doing a lot of the work as well. And I just love how you pull this together. And what we're doing is, if any of you know about research, I just talked to a patient the other day who had a mold litigation case, and he was talking about how in the um, legal system, he's trying to prove that his daughter was sick from mold. And it's almost impossible because what happens is what's the standard of care in medicine right now is 20 years old. So what we're doing in medicine right now as the standard um, is very, very old as far as the research. What you and I are doing and what we love to do is push the envelope, get the research out there. Because what happens is this, just like I talked about my patient, he brought all kinds of studies about toxicity and health, and he could prove it because the research was up to date with what he was seeing in his daughter. But when he came in the court of law, he was trying to prove what, what does medicine say? And sadly, while I love allopathic medicine, what medicine says is very delayed. So the research right now in 20 or 30 years, that might be standard of care. And what I love about framing this conversation is we are on the cutting bleeding edge of what does the data show about pathways. And we're actually saying, could this be part of the issue? We're not saying that we have a for sure drug or supplement that's been studied 20 years, but we're saying, looking at this pathways, this makes sense and this may be contributing. And I love being on the cutting edge because what I see, Bob, and I know you do too, 
is miracles because we're pushing that envelope and doing things that we feel are very safe with patients that might be brand new and we're making a difference. And I love being here with you because I know some of the information, especially today is gonna to be on that cutting edge for these complex chronic conditions. We've been seeing infections and toxins for decades. I've been doing this 20 years, this is not new, but the pandemic has really accentuated the need for chronic um, uh, lenses to view infections and toxins. And especially because this um, pandemic infection infected so many, many more people than maybe Lyme disease, all of a sudden we're seeing on a new level, the patients who need our help. So without further ado, I'm gonna let you share your screen and dive right in. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, Cause I pulled an article and I was like, I was reading this uh, last week and I talked to one of my friends. We had a game night the other night and the talk was on blood viscosity. Can you imagine at Dr. Jill's house? Game night is all about, you know, what else is new in the world. So this article was talking about how the thickness of the blood has a lot to do with morbidity and mortality, meaning like cause of illness and death and symptoms. We know that there's an effect with COVID on this, and we've known for decades that there's an effect with other viruses, other infections, toxins. And today we're specifically talking about the branteus pathway and platelet activation, but this all has to do with the thickness of your blood. And if you don't think that's relevant, think again, because we're going to show you some amazing evidence. I read in this article, and this was profound, that over the age of 60, our blood viscosity, regardless of infection or toxin, exponentially increases. And so that's part of the increased risk of stroke and heart attack and all of these things. So I feel like in my um, expertise right now, this area of learning is going to be one of the most profound things that changes how I practice medicine. So go ahead and show us your slides, Bob, and let's dive right in. Okay, let's get to it. And uh, thank you for that uh, that introduction. Always so much fun to be here with you, Dr. Jill. And uh, I am so excited to uh, present this because this is uh, mind-boggling what we're going to uh, to look at. And of course, you always mention this is educational, informational only. We're not practicing medicine, telling anyone how to diagnose or treat any disease. And I think people have seen this slide before, but I plugged it in again. The platelet activation, the 3D chest game played underwater because there's so many factors that uh, play together with this. So we're going to be talking today about platelet activation and aggregation. So I found this uh, cool little chart. So let's talk first about what platelets are. Uh, what a miracle they are. They float around in our blood and they just kind of are there. And if we ever get a cut or a wound, they go from a resting platelet, they get activated then they become aggregated where they clot and they're your friend because they keep you from bleeding to death or losing all your blood. So, you know, Dr. Jill, one of the things we've talked about in every interview we've done here, we've talked about that many of the things we're talking about are helpful unless they're excessive. That theme just keeps coming up for us. And the same way with your um, blood clotting. Without this, the least little cut, you bleed to death. Excessive, that's where you get the blood clots and uh, then you're more prone to heart attacks and strokes. And Bob, just on that line, what I'm seeing in clinical practice, I'm actually starting to test patients for coagulation deficits in the blood, a huge panel. What's interesting in most of them who have issues, they have not only bleeding issues, but clotting issues both at the same time. So this is very relevant because it's at Goldilocks, you can have some severe issues and you can actually be hypercoagulable and hypocoagulable, meaning you can clot easier, but also bleed easier at the same time, it's different pathways. Interesting. All right, here's uh, some blood clot 101. I think most people know this, but just in case they don't. It's a mass of blood that forms when platelets, proteins, and cells stick together. And then, as we said, your body forms a blood clot to stop the bleeding. Uh, then your body usually breaks down and removes the clot, but sometimes they form where they shouldn't, your body makes too many, or the blood clots don't break down like they should. And this can cause health problems for us. Uh, they can form and travel to the blood vessels in the limbs, lungs, brain, heart, and kidneys. Deep vein thrombosis, I'm sure people have heard about that, deep vein. Pulmonary embolism, it's another problem. Or they can affect ischemic stroke, heart attack, kidney problems, kidney failure, and pregnancy-related problems. Um, here's an article we always like to say that everything we talk about is peer-reviewed studies. And this talks about arterial hyper coagulability as a cause of stroke in adults. Now, this I found very fascinating. 
the deadly type of stroke increasing among younger and middle-aged adults. And this was just published, you can see here, uh, February 4th of this year. And uh, this was in the uh, American Heart Association Journal Stroke. It said new cases of debilitating and often deadly type of stroke that causes bleeding in the brain have been increasing in the U.S., growing at an even faster rate on young, younger to middle-aged adults than older ones. 11% increase over the past decade. Mm. And again, it was just uh, published in a, uh, in a journal. Uh, so something's going on that's uh, causing this uh, to occur. Uh, I'll be honest, this is an area we're just starting to research. Uh, and until I started digging into this, I had no idea that platelets carried serotonin. Fascinating. Mm. Platelets transport serotonin at a high concentration in dense granules and release it upon activation. Uh, besides the clotting, serotonin influences a variety of immune functions. Fascinating. Serotonin levels are elevated in autoimmune disease, such as asthma, RA, and during tissue regeneration after ischemia. Specific antagonism of serotonin receptors appears to improve survival after a heart attack or sepsis. And they're saying in conclusion, targeting immune modulatory effects of platelet serotonin may provide novel therapeutic options for common health problems. Uh, so I was uh, really stunned by this, that your platelets carry serotonin, and we don't quite yet understand the relationship between that and serotonin in the brain. It's very complex. And I just had a conversation recently with a psychiatrist who said it's now being believed that the SSRIs are somehow uh, impacting this and helping it in some way. So absolutely uh, fascinating. Bob, I have a comment on that because fluvoxamine, sure. which has been used at times for long COVID, um, I won't go into the details of that, but I looked at several articles and it has to do with the hemoxygenase, which we'll, you'll talk about today, I'm sure. And these yes. have to be hemoxygenase agonist, I believe. I'll, I, I may be saying that wrong. So, but there's a co correlation with this, especially that particular SSRI and heme oxygenase. So let's make a note and then we talk about that later, it may come to play. Yes, absolutely. Now, platelets do not synthesize serotonin, but they acquire it from specialized cells in the GI tract. However, the serotonin secreted from platelets may have a role in platelet aggregation and therefore clot formation. And serotonin may have vasoconstrictive properties. So, uh, you know, I used to always think of serotonin as, you know, the happy thing for the brain, but it's much more than that. Uh, elevated plasma levels of serotonin have been found in hypertension and thrombosis. So a lot to learn on this. So uh, we could probably do a half hour, 45 minute talk on that someday. But for right now, we're just hitting the, uh, the highlights here. Now, here is what we're going to talk about today. So that old adage, we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you, then tell you, then tell you what we told you. So uh, this is a, a map. And just for those who are new to this, these purple ovals are enzymes. Your DNA makes the enzymes. And we can have what are called genetic mutations or SNPs, where that enzyme most of the time is underactive, but sometimes overactive. Now, what a miracle we are. Here's an enzyme called TNFA, tumor necrosis factor. And this is the first time uh, we've spoken about this in our many interviews. I think this is what, number eight or number nine, I believe, Dr. Joseph. Yeah, we have a, and yeah, if you want to listen to any of those, they're all on YouTube. We've got some great ones. Mm -hmm. So tumor necrosis factor kicks in perhaps when we have some mycotoxins or clostridia, even Bartonella, and any source of lipopolysaccharides, gram negative bacteria. They stimulate tumor necrosis factor. Is that a good thing? Sure. And if anybody's listened to us before, you know what the next sentence is, unless it's overactive. And interestingly, you can have a genetic mutation on TNFA that makes it over respond. I know we've spoken before about the HFE gene. And when this is mutated, we can absorb a little bit more iron. When people get two copies of this, they many times have what's called hemochromatosis but very common in the English, Irish, and Ashkenazi Jewish to have one copy of this, which causes you to absorb a little bit more iron. And that also stimulates tumor, necro tumor necrosis factor alpha. What we've been clinically observing in our health coaching 
is that when people have an upregulation of TNFA and the HFE, these folks have many times lots of inflammation that no one can seem to uh, to resolve. Bob, I know this well because I'm a carrier, and I just want to mention for those of you listening, this is something you can ask your doctor to test. You can test iron and iron studies. I always recommend that. I test that in all my patients just to check if there's iron excess in your blood, but you can also ask for the hemochromatosis gene. It's a very easy test to perform. Insurance may or may not cover it, and it will tell you if you're a carrier. And of course, Bob, your genetics will do the same, so it doesn't, but if someone just wants to ask their regular doctor, hemochromatosis genetics are not difficult to order. Absolutely. Very common in the English and the Irish. A funny story behind that, the, you know, the, the reason the Irish came to America was because of potato famines. So by natural selection, the women who had this gene, they absorbed more iron, that made them healthy enough to have babies during times of famine. Uh, isn't that fascinating? Wow. Yeah. So the, uh, that stimulates the NF-kappa B, which is another inflammatory enzyme. That stimulates NOx, NADPH oxidase, and we did a whole uh, recording on this. I'm going to talk a little bit about CERT1, sirtuin one which calms these guys down. And we did a whole show on interleukin-6, how that stimulates it. Now, something that's being talked about quite a bit is mast cells. And mast cells are white blood cells. Again, they're our friends. They're there to help us if we have an infection. But I'm sure anyone who's uh, paying attention to to the, to the health situation now, they're constantly hearing about mast cell activation, where the mast cells are becoming excessive. Uh, and when they become excessive, that's when they can be harmful. Uh, Dr. Jill, in, in your work, I mean, what percentage of your patients do you think have excess mast cell production? Yeah, Bob, I was going to comment because this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, almost all now I see mostly complex chronic patients which have Lyme or mold or some other infectious load or chronic fatigue. And I would say at least 50%, maybe upwards of 70% have mast cell issues as part of their clinical picture. Sure. And probably when you started, it was probably not seen very much at all. No. In fact, I'll just tell you, 20 years ago in medical school, we were taught about mastocytosis, which is a blood cell disorder in the bone marrow, almost like a proliferative, kind of like a precancerous type of condition. We hardly ever, we are, that's considered a zebra, which means it's really rare. And we didn't even get taught about mast cell activation, which is more a normal number of mast cells that are overactive. And now we know that environmental triggers, toxins, infections, et cetera, some of the things we'll talk about today are triggers to those mast cells. And the fact that I'm seeing more and more and more of that tells us tells me our load of infections and toxins is getting really high in the environment. Absolutely. I should also mention that mercury induces NF-kappa B, COX-2 and INOS, and glyphosate stimulates NF-kappa B. That's Roundup. Then, of course, the mast cells make histamine. By the way, we did a whole show on histamine. Now, this is new information here, Dr. Jill. Uh, I would advise everybody really watch this the uh, the video we did on um, INOS, and we actually called it the Carnahan reaction, where the INOS enzyme, which makes a lot of nitric oxide to kill pathogens, gets upregulated, and it gets upregulated when we have virus, bacteria, or fungus, which is a good thing, unless overactive. INOS inhibits ENOS, that's endothelial nitric oxide, which is circulatory. So I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Raynaud's or Raynaud's, mm -hmm. that's where you have cold hands and feet, or just general circulatory problems in general, many times we don't have endothelial nitric oxide because the INOS inhibits the ENOS. And as we'll talk about later, uh, there are genetic mutations that cause the INOS to be upregulated. We'll get to that later. And Bob, no, maybe because people, if they didn't hear, I'll just do one minute or 30 seconds here because my story, which Bob helped me figure out was, um, I always called ketomium one of the molds that I had been exposed to in the past, the narcoleptic mold, because when I would get exposed to this mold, I'd literally like pass out. I'd have to lay down. My blood pressure would be 85 over 55. I couldn't sustain, you know, um, the position upright. And I talked to Bob one day and we were trying to figure out what might be going on. And he looked at my genetics and I happened to have a very rare combination of upregulation of that INOS too. So what was happening for me was massive vasodilation, almost like if you're in septic shock 
where your cyst, your circulation opens so wide up, you can't get pressure to the brain when you're upright. So we kind of figure that out and that's thus the name. But I wanted to mention at the same time with those symptoms, sometimes I would have actually like either cold hands or feet or achy legs, which indicated that INOS three was being downregulated. So it all kind of made sense when we talked about it. Absolutely. So glad we found that for you. And that's, as we said, that's why we call it the Carnahan reaction. And I'll, I have a couple of slides to, uh, to explain it when we get there. Uh, aluminum, mercury, uranium, plastics. And uh, I think someday we're going to look back and see a big oops over all the plastics in the way it's uh, getting down into microparticles, electromagnetic fields, high fructose corn syrup, gluten, glyphosate, all stimulate the INOS enzyme. I think some people are probably having an aha moment at this point because look what INOS does. It activates platelets. And ENOS uh, will calm it down. So remember that slide we showed you how the platelets get activated. Then they create something called RANTES, and that's the next slides we're going to go over. So hold on to that term here, RANTES. Uh, that's really the crux of what we're talking about here today. So that INOS stimulates the platelets. Now, on the other hand, when tumor necrosis factor gets upregulated, it will stimulate an enzyme called COX-2. And COX-2 will cause the body to take arachidonic acid, which is one of the fats, and pull it out of the cell membrane and go down a pathway where it stimulates something called thromboxane A2. And once again, stimulates and activates the platelets. Now, also, you'll notice up here, superoxide, peroxynitrite. I think way early we did a, a video on peroxynitrite. We talked about EMF. Uh, the calmodulant comes from EMF. Lipopolysaccharides, histamine, mTOR. All of those stimulate the phospholipase A2 enzyme to pull out this arachidonic acid. So here's pathway number two that can stimulate platelets and the rantes. Now, pathway number three. We did a video where we talked about the home cycle on interleukin-6. Again, interleukin-6 is a cytokine. It's our friend, unless it's overactive. So you can have genetic mutations in IL-6, or you can have multiple environmental factors that stimulate IL-6. I encourage you to watch our video on that. Stimulate superoxide more mast cells, more histamine. Stimulate, uh, histamine stimulates rantes. Rantes stimulates mast cells. We've got a little bit of a- Vicious feedback. cycle, Bob, I call that, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Then superoxide, mast cells, and histamine stimulate what's called the renin-angiotensin system, where we make angiotensin II that'll cause aldosterone that can cause high blood pressure, but angiotensin II stimulates rantes. Then finally, we all know the benefits of the omega-3 fatty acids and your fish oils, and uh, they're, they're your good fats, and then you have your bad fats. There's enzymes called the fatty acid desaturases and ELOVL2 that end up making something called protectins and resolvins. And they will inhibit that activation of the platelets. Now we have slides and peer reviewed studies, but uh, that is uh, basically what we're gonna tell you today. How environmental toxins combined with genetic weakness can cause this pathway to be upregulated. Uh, we can also have multiple things that can cause this pathway to be upregulated. And here in our clinic, we've been doing a lot of measuring of the omega-3s. And then also there's a urine test that you can measure the uh, thromboxane A2. Um, are you finding that, I'm sure you do look at some uh, some folks' omega-3s and 6s and arachidonic acid, Yeah, finding those out of balance just a bit? Thanks. I was going to mention that because again, try to put, if you're listening, practical application, you can get omega testing through um, Genova Diagnostics, through uh, Great Plains and the um, thromboxane A2. Bob, where can they, where can that be tested through the urine? Do you know what lab? Uh, yes, yep. there's a, uh, we can maybe put that in one of the, sure. the links. Okay. And I think people can go there on their own if they want. Okay. We'll, we'll put that uh, in, in the link. Yeah, because if you but have a, oh, go ahead. So, sorry, Bob, go ahead. Go right ahead. 
It's called what? What were you going to say? Oh, it's called uh, inflammation test, a uh, chronic inflammation test. Okay. Yeah, we'll get and, the uh, link. So that way we don't have to worry about you. So the hang, the hang tie, we'll be sure and link those. But you can ask your doctor. I mean, you maybe need a functional doctor who understands this, but even um, Quest and LabCorp have Omega panels. So this is not something that's outside the reach of the normal physician to order for you. Um, and I was going to mention uh, those pro protectants and resolvents. Would that include SPMs and DHA? Mm -hmm. Are those on the, Okay. Yeah, SPMs. Yeah. Yeah. There's two companies that make them and uh, they're getting quite a bit of attention in the phone medicine world that and we'll get to this. If this pathway doesn't work, you can just jump right down here and take the protections and resolvents to calm things down. I have seen that be very powerful in either right post COVID, um, uh, long COVID and in myself. And now of course it makes sense why. So SPMs, I'll put links to some, some of those brands in the uh, chat here, or if you're listening um, anywhere else as well. Sure. And if anyone would like this chart to study it, uh, just go to neutrogenicresearch.org slash research download. We don't ask for your email. There's no charge. There's no catch. Uh, you can lo download the PDF if you'd like to, uh, dig into this. All right, now we're going to talk about T's. What an interesting name. Regulated upon activation, normal T cells expressed and secreted. Wow, <laughs> that's quite the, uh, quite the name here. Uh, or also called CCL5. It's a pro-inflammatory mediator of the cytokine chemokine family. Here's the key point. Regulates the mobilization and survival of immune inflammatory cells from the bloodstream into tissues and other areas of injury infection. Can that be a good thing? Sure. When it's excessive, can it be a bad thing? Of course. So here they're saying sustained production is associated with several detrimental effects, uh, such as you know, heart disease, liver disease, viral infection. Treatments that interfere with RANTES are associated with improved outcomes. Now, there's many things that will stimulate the, the RANTES. For our discussion today, we're looking at the platelets because the activated platelets stimulate the RANTES. As we said, look what RANTES stimulates, histamine secretion by mast cells, IgE and IgG production by the lymphocytes, activation and proliferation of the natural killer cells. It recruits T cells, macrophages, eosinophils, and basophils to sites of inflammation. Again, necessary for our survival, but harmful when in excess. Now, we're gonna just go through these slides pretty quick. We're not gonna read them in any detail, but just so people understand, what is some medical literature that says what's related to RANTES? And by the way, Dr. Jill, I think we're just scratching the surface. I mean, I just keyed a few things and found some things, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, for the liver, uh, it mediates hepatic injury and promotes fibrosis. So uh, it, if somebody's got liver disease going on, uh, Durantes in excess can be a problem. Autism spectrum disorder. In a study of young autistic patients, Durantes and other chemokines were shown to be higher when compared with typically developing children. And of course, key word here is hypothesis, that all their chemokine levels are involved in autism spectrum disorder. I think it would be you know, inappropriate to say, yeah, this is the issue, but it's probably one of the contributing uh, factors. So they're saying chemokine plasma levels could be potential biomarkers for, uh, for autism. Uh, inflammation, uh, fundamental role in histamine and serotonin generation and cell function. This study was on uh, eczema and uh, the, the, the Rantes played a role in the ongoing chronic inflammation of atopic eczema and reflected the severity of the disease. Uh, heart disease. Chemokines like Rantes control the recruitment of leukocytes within the vascular wall, essential in the development of the plaque formation. Um, what they did is they did a little study. They took something that knocked down Rantes and it was shown to reduce the progression of the heart disease. So this study is saying, keyword, potentially new therapeutic uh, strategy. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn's disease. So as, uh, as you know, Dr. Jill, that's something that you were trying to figure out uh, why you were struggling with it. And they're saying here the frequency of the, of the Rantes was greatest in severely inflamed tissue. Uh, and they were saying significant redundancy in the generation of these signals in chronic inflammation. And it was infrequent in normal colon. So it appears to be higher in inflammatory bowel disease. 
Now, this is interesting. You spoke about uh, COVID. In 10 terminally ill critical COVID-19 patients, profound elevations of interleukin-6 and RANTES. And then what they did is they, they took a, this was like a, a, a trial. This is a, uh, blocks the, uh, the RANTES going into the receptor sites. And they noticed a significant decrease in the COVID plasma virus after using that uh, drug. So there is research going on. And uh, there is a doctor, Dr. Bruce Patterson, who put out a, a paper. It's still not uh, peer reviewed yet. It's in preprint. But he's saying that uh, COVID is really a Rantes disease. Um, probably a little more complex than that, but clearly seems to be elevated in people with COVID. Children with RSV infections have increased CCL5 protein levels in both the upper and lower airway secretions, and it correlates positively with the disease severity. Uh, here we're talking about prostate cancer. The Rantes seems to be elevated in uh, prostate cancer as well. And here's just a little chart that shows when we have obesity and too much adipose tissue, and then we get the inflammation, heart disease, liver issues, and beta cell degeneration in the pancreas. Ranty is being one of the players that uh, causes all of that. Now, what are some things that stimulate Ranty's? Um, so what we're saying is that uh, platelets function as the cells that promote immunity inflammation, but they do stimulate Ranty's. So if our platelets get too activated, they will stimulate Ranty's. Lyme disease. And uh, this is one area that we'd like to study. Um, I'm hoping to be able to get uh, lots of people with Lyme disease uh, to measure their, uh, their Rantes. Uh, but they discovered that uh, Borrelia appears to be a strong inducer of those chemokines. And as we know, some people get Lyme disease, they don't even know they had it. Others do one round of antibiotics, they're fine. And others are study are, uh, for years, they are dealing with all the massive inflammation and they see the best doctors, they get the best antibiotics, they do the, all the herbal things and they still continue to struggle. Those are the chronic Lyme individuals. And uh, one of the things we need to research is how much the stimulation of Rantes may be a factor. We don't know yet, but that's a, an area of research that we need to, uh, to look at. Um, now, Rantes stimulation is also related to NF-kappa B. The strength of Rantes has been shown to be highly dependent on the pre-existence of NF-kappa B. And then here it says also iron has been shown to serve as a direct agonist, means it stimulates NF-kappa B, tumor necrosis factor alpha promoter activity, and the release of the TNF-alpha protein. So once again, that iron in excess kicks this all off. And again, just observing, clinically observing, those who have mycotoxins, Lyme, upregulation of TNFA, and overabsorption of the iron are the ones that are just debilitated by their Lyme disease. I'm sure you see that as well. I mean, some people have Lyme, they're doing okay, and other people are really in seriously bad shape. Yeah, Bob, I couldn't agree more. And I've been watching that iron connection for a while. I just, and I haven't always known all the pathways. I just know, gosh, if you have a carrier state or a full-blown hemochromatosis, you're going to struggle more with inflammation and infections. Mm -hmm. um, here we're just saying, once again, mast cells, um, you know, produce the histamine and then the histamine enhances the production of the rantes. So that we're just showing the literature that shows how the mast cells create the histamine. The histamine then stimulates the Rantes. Interesting correlation. Until we dug into the literature, we had no idea these were connected. So here again, mycotoxins are sources of lipopolysaccharides, stimulate tumor necrosis factor, and begin this cascade. Clostridia, Bartonella, lipopolysaccharides, mercury, glyphosate, and these are some of the genetic mutations because the tumor necrosis factor mutations a gain of function. HFE is a gain of function. And we're going to be talking about the sirtuins, uh, lowered function, and IL-6 gain of function. So the more environmental factors you have combined with genetic mutations, 
increases the potential for this thing to uh, to take off and then as we said eventually stimulate the uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase and we're going to talk a little bit about tumor necrosis factor and down here is the rs number that when it is mutated causes to have a gain of function tnf alpha is an inflammatory cytokine produced during acute inflammation and is responsible for diverse range of signaling events within the cells leading to necrosis or apoptosis is that a good thing sure unless it's overactive increased tnfa along with other genetic and epigenetic factors stimulates pla2 that's the one that brings out the arachidonic acid that uh, then stimulates thromboxane a2 thus leading to platelet activation and increased grantees on the other hand nf kappa b plays a variety of evolutionary conserved roles cytokines belonging to the tnfm tnf family induce genes regulating inflammation cell survival proliferation primarily through activation of nf kappa b so tnfa stimulates nf kappa b and what we're finding is when individuals have a homozygous variant here these are individuals that are just so inflamed and you know they're going from one clinic to another trying to find help and uh, they're not being very successful because this tnfa is uh, upregulated over responding in response to uh, lipopolysaccharides due to your gram negative sepsis uh, the monocytes are triggered to produce large quantities of tnfa several studies have identified the pathways that are activated like by lipopolysaccharides also including the nf kappa b so when you're exposed to these lpss both of these get upregulated and they're saying the concentration of rantes has been shown to increase due to the addition of the tnfa and the lipopolysaccharides so you can see how this thing just feeds upon itself now we're going to talk about uh, mold this is a, um, a mold test okra toxin this many times comes from water damaged buildings very very common this is gliotoxin here's the peer-reviewed study okra toxin is a natural fungal secondary metabolite and it triggers significant modulation of interleukin 2 and tumor necrosis factor alpha so dr jill how common do you see uh, mold toxicity in the people who come to you who are just uh, really struggling and coming to you because they can't get help elsewhere yeah, so Bob, this is a huge thing because a lot of people come, they might know that they have a diagnosis of Borrelia, which is Lyme or Bartonella or some other gut issues. Um, but when I always feel like, first of all, I'm always asking questions about mold, but if they're not getting better on what should be helpful, I always ask and test for mold because what I found is many times that's the factor in their environment that's weakening their immune system and creating additional inflammation that has not been addressed. So I would say very frequently mold is this hidden factor they don't know about that's making them kind of at a standstill with their health. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's rampant. Uh, now there's a couple of nutrients that inhibit TNFA and there's probably gonna be more, but we've scoured the literature, black cumin, curcumin, quercetin, and milk thistle. Uh, all of those will calm down TNFA. Now, CERT-1, I'm finding this to be uh, very, very important. It's part of the search ones. And if you study uh, longevity, one of the things they're looking at is the CERT-1s and how to preserve their activity. We're going to talk more about the CERT-1s. For right now, we're going to talk about how they inhibit NADPH oxidase and NF-kappa-B. It's one of the most well-studied search ones, significant role in development, a marker of cell sentience when uh, the cells die. It decreases during aging, likely due to NAD plus deficiency. Decreased levels, levels are found in the aging liver. CERT1 plays a critical role in MAOA, and I have another chart for this, AMPK, regulation of FOXO, a very important antioxidant called superoxide dismutase. The endothelial nitric oxide that we spoke about inhibits NOx, NF kappa B, IDF1, and mTOR. That stands for mammalian target of rapamycin, the growth of new cells. Is that important? Sure. It, when it's excessive, it creates problems because it inhibits what's called autophagy, the cleaning of the cells. 
we should probably spend more time on this, but high fructose corn syrup inhibits SIRT1. You know, we've all known that these artificial sweeteners probably aren't that good for us. But when I learned that it inhibits this SIRT1, it was like, oh my goodness, that's a big deal. Resveratrol, quercetin, and caloric restriction may activate SIRT1 activity. That's your intermittent fasting. So when we deprive the body of nutrients for a little while, mTOR, which is the growth of new cells, says, hmm, I don't have any nutrients. Okay, janitors, come out and do your job. And then that supports the SIRT1. And again, just observing in our health coaching, when people have mutations in SIRT1, particularly homozygous, they're really struggling. Um, I'm not going to read all of this. This is way too much. But this just illustrates all of the ways that SIRT1 is helpful to us. And perhaps we can put a link to the slides or maybe put a link to this if somebody really wants to read this. But we're not going to just go through and uh, read all of this. But bottom line is SIRT1 is really important for your long-term health. And Bob, if I can just uh, put it into layman's terms real quick, because you did a great job of explaining mTOR and autophagy, but I want you listeners to understand that mTOR is stimulated by growth hormone, by peptides that a lot of bodybuilders use, by anabolic steroids, even testosterone or um, anything like that. There's a lot of people out there using these kinds of things to decrease body fat, increase muscle mass, get into great shape. Um, That's basically pushing um, the creation of new cells, new muscle, all good. But if you don't have autophagy, autophagy, as Bob said, is the cleanup, which helps prevent cancer cells. We have cells all the time that are going rogue that could become excessively division or causing um, rapid you know, division, anything in that realm will cause a proneness to cancer. So we need both. And I wonder, and we saw with COVID people with higher testosterone on anabolic steroids, any of those realms that were pushing mTOR, they had worse outcomes. In fact, some of the treatments were um, suppression of testosterone. So th- I just wonder if that was related to the CERT1. And then you mentioned corn uh, syrup and obviously a standard American diet with uh, lots of fast food, high fructose corn syrup. We know metabolically, if people were uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, they also fared worse with COVID. And those two things make me wonder as related to the CERT1 genetics here? Yeah, I believe so. I've wondered the same thing. And there is some literature out there that COVID uses mTOR for replication Mm -hmm. uh, because mTOR replicates and it's sort of like a copy machine. Doesn't matter what you put on the glass, it'll copy it. So healthy cell, cancer cell, and possibly COVID. And I observed that as well because sometimes you'd hear about these uh, young men that uh, were, were dying while somebody 78 years old survived. And it's like, well, what's going on there. And um, I mean, there's many components to it, but that may be a factor. Now, I really like this slide. CERT1 supports ENOS. Remember, we talked about that earlier, and ethylene nitric oxide, the healthy blood flow, supports peroxide dismutase, a very important antioxidant, inhibits NF-kappa B. Look at this one, inhibits mTOR, and supports MAOA, which is the clearing of histamine. High fructose corn syrup inhibits, resveratrol helps. And uh, and your nitrates uh, also seem to uh, support CERD1. That's like your uh, arugula and beets and things like that. So here's the the RS number, 12778366. And uh, when it's mutated, uh, that's when that CERD1 activity may not be as robust as it should be. Uh, I would have to say I put that on my top 10 list of SNPs that uh, may have an impact on us from a functional standpoint. Um, now, we've also spoke about mast cells become overreactive and uh, likely present in 9 to 14% of the population. And we're just mentioning here there are enzymes called KIT. There are a couple mutations in the KIT enzymes, and there's too many to list, that will actually cause the mast cells to be trigger happy, respond too quickly. And uh, most people know uh, some of this, but we'll just review it a little bit. When the mast cells get activated, we make more histamine or interleukins, stimulates tumor necrosis factor A. So I probably on my chart ought to have a line going from the mast cells back to the tumor necrosis factor in another feedback loop. Now let's talk about histamine. And by the way, Dr. Jill and I did a uh, 
a long interview on histamine. Here's the cliff notes. They can be stimulated by allergens or high histamine foods. And when we make histamine, we need cortisol to degrade it. The body makes something called dynamine oxidase. There's an enzyme called histamine and methyltransferase, MAOA, and glucuronidation, all of which clear histamine. One of the most common things we see in our health coaching is people have genetic mutations in these enzymes that they don't degrade enough histamine. And then there's another one called histidine decarboxylase that actually takes an amino acid called histidine and turns it into histamine. We're looking through the literature, but there are some that are considered pathological and we are just uh, hypothesizing that they're gain of function, but we're not quite sure. But whenever we see mutations in HDC, uh, many times these folks have uh, high levels of histamine, even confirmed by, uh, by blood work. What, uh, what percentage of the folks you see, Dr. Jill, do you think have a uh, histamine problem as you know, one of the things they're dealing with? Yeah, Bob, again, just like the mast cell activation and all the things that that produces, this is one thing, but it's very, very common. And one thing I was thinking as you were talking is I think it's related to our load. I think that's why things are getting worse because our environmental toxic load, and you've just talked about all kinds of triggers in the environment that can do this. And what it is doing is revealing these deficits in genetics that maybe were there, but when the load was low, no one noticed. And now that we have more toxins, more chemicals, more glyphosate, more high fructose corn syrup, more stress, more lack of sleep, and I could go on. And all of these things affect our ability to deal with the environment. So I think it's exponentially increasing. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Um, now, here's a peer-reviewed study. Histamine stimulates INOS expression. Now, when we did our uh, our talk on uh, Carnahan reaction, we didn't have this piece of information. We didn't know that histamine stimulates the uh, the INOS as well. We had this slide before, but just in this chain of events, we're just saying histamine enhances the production of the RANs. So, uh, really encourage you to watch this uh, this video. It's uh, our number your number thirty four where we talked about histamine. I mean, that's all we spoke about in that whole. That whole talk, 45 minutes on histamine. So we got into the histamine foods, uh, the DAO enzyme, a lot of detail. So if somebody wants to learn, uh, look up number 34. That was, a, that was a fun interview, Dr. Jill. They've all been fun. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> now we're going to talk about nitric oxide, the miracle molecule. 1998 won a Nobel Prize for three scientists on the benefit of nitric oxide. It's an incredibly simple molecule nitrogen and oxygen. However, it's one of the most significant molecules in the body, critical to your well-being. Acts as a vasodilator, causes the blood vessels to expand, uh, including reducing blood pressure, flow of nutrients to the muscles, improving the efficiency of which waste are removed from the muscles and organs. I mean, if we don't have good blood flow to the liver or kidneys, they're going to struggle. Stimulates the brain, helps men with erectile function, and impotence, that's why they take Viagra and Cialis to help with nitric oxide. Increase energy, support wound healing, and support the immune system. It influences every body organ, including the lungs, liver, kidney, stomach, genitals, and of course, the heart. Again, I'm not gonna read this. Um, way too many things to just sit here and read, but this just illustrates the importance of nitric oxide. Now, INOS, so what we were talking about, all those benefits, is endothelial nitric oxide, helps circulation. There's another enzyme called INOS, inducible nitric oxide. And what does it do? It kills virus, bacteria, and pathogens. Is that a good thing? Sure, unless it's overactive. How many times have I said that now, Dr. Jill? <laughs> I love it. You know, Bob, what's so great about this is our body was created to fight infections and to take care of toxins. Like some people get all worried and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm toxic with mold. What am I going to do? Well, guess what? If you get yourself out of the environment, even without supplements, you would probably slowly detox because your body's created. What we're talking about is when the load is too heavy or the infection's too great or our stress is too high. Or as you mentioned, and you're the expert in this realm is the genetic mutations that make our particular pathway mutated and excessive. So it's really, um, the, these aren't bad things. They're just um, too much or too little can be an issue. Absolutely. Back to Goldilocks and the three bears. So 
INOX generates very high amounts of nitric oxide to fight. Total eliminations is shown to increase the infections. I mean, we wouldn't survive if we didn't have INOX to kill the pathogens. On the other hand, excessive has been associated with many health concerns. It's linked to tissue damage and organ dysfunction. Now, this is a, um, a chart that we may have had when we were, uh, when we did our uh, video on, uh, on INOS. And again, I would encourage you to watch that, that video, but here's the, here's the cliff notes. And we sort of alluded to this before. ENOS is your endothelial nitric oxide. INOS, the inducible nitric oxide, helps with circulation, kills pathogens. When you've got the histamine or many other things, that stimulate this. Uh, you can see here, here's the list, aluminum, mercury, uranium, plastics, ethanol, EMF, high fructose corn syrup, gluten, chlorine and fluoride, Roundup, high homocysteine, iron overload, stimulate the INOS, inhibit the ENOS. There's a substance called BH4, tetrahydroboroptin that's needed to do this. If INOS keeps running too hard, we run out of BH4, and it's called NOS uncoupling that we'll talk about a little bit later, but while we're on the map, I want to show you, when we run out of BH4, we make superoxide free radical. And what we're going to show you in a little while is superoxide stimulates the PLA2 enzyme to make more rantes. And there's a lot that can go wrong here. Um, we're not going into it today, but there are pathways where we make BH4, some of it beginning from the citric acid cycle. Um, then there's also the folate that comes in here. But when the BH4 gets depleted, BH4 is needed to turn tryptophan into serotonin, tyrosine into L-dopa. If this gets severe enough, you're gonna have tremors and at real severity, potential Parkinson's, and the phenylalanine into tyrosine. So can't tell you how many people have mood has been boosted when we give them something as simple as royal jelly they can handle it and that boosts the bh4 and they start making their serotonin now this is what we call the uh, the carnahan reaction and we're going to show you that in uh, just a moment here but firstly inos activation and platelet secretion INOS activation influences platelet secretion. INOS knockout mice have prolonged bleeding time. So in other words, if you don't have the, uh, the platelets activating, you're gonna bleed to death. But in excess, that's when you get the, the clots. So when we did our, uh, our, our recording, Dr. Jill on INOS, we didn't know that uh, INOS actually activates the platelets as well. Wow. Um, and this is now talking about the ENOS. The activity level of ENOS enzymes was significantly lower in patients' uh, platelets with coronary thrombosis. So here they're saying this data was consistent with the reduction of the expression levels of ENOS in patients with the thrombosis. So INOS causes platelet activation. ENOS eases the burden. So that's why that ENOS-INOS balance is uh, so important. So um, here's a peer-reviewed study published uh, back in 2021, uh, PubMed, then a medical journal called Nitric Oxide, and they're talking about COVID on ENOS and INOS activity. And this simplifies it. This is a chart in a peer-reviewed study that appeared in a medical journal. As we create more INOS in an effort to kill the, the virus, this is where we can get the inflammation as it pushes down ENOS we get the blood clots. And this is possibly why COVID is uh, causing higher levels of, uh, of blood clots and strokes. Bob, I'm gonna, if you have just a second, I wanna share something really interesting. I haven't even showed this to you yet. And I think I can share just one picture and then explain really quick because something happened to me about a year and a half ago, cause you know, I'm the guinea pig. Can you see that picture for one second of my leg on top of the screen? Uh, I don't know if it's coming through or no, it, there it goes. I okay. Yeah. Then, is it coming through? Okay. There, and I'll take this off so we can go back to your slides. So this is my leg a year and a half ago. And I want to tell you a real quick story that I think relates to this. 
I all of a sudden out of the blue got a very high fever, 104.5. I've never had that high of a fever in my life. Um, I suspected COVID. I did not test positive, but we know that sometimes there can be errors in that. And I just stayed home and isolated. So after one test, I just assumed within 24 hours, I developed a blood clot and cellulitis. This is a picture of my leg. Um, I've literally never shared that before. I go back to your oh. screen, but I wanted to show you because I believe I probably had COVID. We don't know for sure, but if that's correct, we know I already have a platelet issue with genetics. And then we also know I have clearly a carnian reaction, which is this increase in INOS. And I believe at that time, whether it was COVID or another virus, it triggered a clot, which triggered a cellulitis. And that was my leg. I needed IV antibiotics to get well from that. Fortunately, I recovered very quickly and no problem, but that's a picture of what can happen with this activation. And I believe this is absolutely related to this INOS pathway and the platelet activation. I want to show you in real life, I've literally experienced this. Um, and <laughs> I should have probably been hospitalized. Fortunately, I have connections and was able to get home IV antibiotics. But yeah. one of my friends was like, Jill, you really need to take this seriously. Your, your leg could, you know. Um, and I do remember this is a funny story lying in bed with 105, almost 105 degree temp. And my thought was, huh, I wonder what temperature my brain will melt. <laughs> <laughs> So just a story to, to show people this is real, this can happen. And again, no, not fear, but I, I'm the guinea pig. So I got to experience that and understand the INOS pathway on a new level. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's incredible, Dr. Jill. Wow. Sorry you went through that. Uh, but like you said, that probably gave you some insight now that you're going to be yep. able to help other people when you see that happening. So I'm not going to read these, but these are all the things that stimulate INOS. So we're wondering why we're seeing more conditions today than we did before. You know, when I was born, there was very little BPA. There was very little in aluminum. We weren't exposed to cell phones. Uh, I don't think mold and mycotoxins were as bad. We certainly didn't have high fructose corn syrup when I was a youngster. Uh, we didn't have glyphosate. So all of these things cumulatively, I believe are having an impact on all of us. But anybody who has genetic weakness gets hit harder, that proverbial canary in the mine. Now, mercury is a stimulator of NF-kappa B. And um, I'm sure, Dr. Joe, you probably check for heavy metal sometimes, and uh, you probably see a fair amount of people with mercury toxicity. I do, especially dentists, unfortunately. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, here is glyphosate. This is the, uh, the Great Plains glyphosate test. And you can see this poor person, they were just pinning the needle. It inhibits SV catalase glutathione peroxidase as well as reduced glutathione and look at this promoted the expression of nf kappa b and inos and tumor necrosis factor alpha so in this study they didn't measure rantes but i think it's not hard to interpolate that if these are high the rantes is going to be high as well and uh, stephanie seneff does a lot of uh, talks on this so if you just Google her name in YouTube, you can find uh, great uh, talks from her. Have you ever had her as a guest or anyone speak about glyphosate? And I have videos? not, Bob, yeah. but it's a great idea. I know Stephanie well. I love her research. I, I'm going to ask her to be on. So stay tuned. We'll we'll have her on. Absolutely, she'll be glad to talk about uh, about glyphosate. Uh, there are a couple of enzymes. I mean, there's there's more than just this one, but there is an enzyme called PON1, and these are the ones that are evidence based. And just again clinically observing when we see a lot of twos on here and the people live in a farming community and we measure their glyphosate uh, usually extraordinarily high so pond one is related to clearing of glyphosate now there's others as well um, so here's again histamine stimulates smooth muscle cells to increase inos expression and uh, we'd encourage everybody i think uh, I just checked the other day, it is still the most watched video in your YouTube uh, where we spoke about interleukin-6. Uh, we went on for one hour and 51 minutes. And, uh, that was really a went... great one. It was so awesome. Yes. So uh, number 42. Uh, and uh, little did I realize at the time, you know, it's interesting. We spoke about peroxynitrite, histamine, the Carnahan reaction, IL-6, the home cycle. And now all of a sudden it's like, they're tying together into this. It's just rather 
astonishing how it all comes together. You know, Bob, I love that you said that. I kind of want to emphasize, we've just been going along learning and, and these pathways are amazing, but we did not expect for it all to, like you said, like today is really accumulation of all of this and how it comes together. And for me, I'm just, first of all, uh, amazed at your work. And I want to say that publicly, we so appreciate it. But secondly, just how it all really, really makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I was kind of blown away when it's like, we were talking about those things separately. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my gosh, they all work together. Yes. <laughs> to create this, uh, this Rantes. So we kind of alluded to this before, but just another quick slide. You know, when you have enough BH4, the ENOS makes nitric oxide. If we run out of BH4, we make superoxide. And I'm going to show this very soon. Superoxide stimulates PLA2. Now, this is, um, there is gain of function mutations in the INOS enzymes. That means it's overactive. And then that'll create more superoxide. So here is the common functional INOS polymorphisms, the RS277-9249. When this is mutated, the, the good one is the C, and then the bad one is the A. So if you would be CA, that means you have one mutation. If you have an AA, you have two mutations. 4.73 times increased INOS expression when you had this genetic mutation. Here's another one, RS2297518. The good one is G, the risk is A. And you can see here that the double A only occurs in 3.9% of the population. It's related to early onset Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. Increased nitrous additive uh, stress, meaning it's making a peroxynitrite and oxidative stress in the, uh, in the gut. And here is the infamous Carnahan reaction. Okay. And uh, Dr. Jill is very brave. She allows us to put her uh, genome uh, on the uh, on the internet. And here's that NOS2 that's upregulated. And this 2 means that mother and father gave her a mutation. The other one that's upregulation, mother and father gave her a mutation. So that's why we're calling it the Carnahan reaction. And here is what can cause that to happen. Again, these things we, we mentioned before, the genetics could be the the NOS2 being gained. I'm not talking about it today, but there's actually a NOS3 lack of function. If we don't make enough superoxide dismutase, CERT1, as we spoke about, uh, supports the production of superoxide dismutase, helps ENOS. DHFR and QDPR help recycle your BH2 to BH4. And uh, the MTHFR A1298 <clears throat> is also involved with making enough uh, a BH4. So if you want to get to more details on the Carnahan reaction, uh, watch the, uh, the video on INOS. And uh, we went through it in, uh, in detail. So um, I'm hoping Dr. Jill, 100 years from now, they're still talking about the Carnahan reaction. <laughs> All for the greater good. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh. Absolutely. Now, pathway number two. There's an enzyme called phospholipase A2, <clears throat> PLA2. And what this one does, it takes arachidonic acid from the cell membrane, and that's one of the fats, pulls it out. And um, I think I'll do a little uh, expansion here. And you can see that superoxide, peroxynitrite, I would encourage you to watch our video on EMF because we get too much calmodulin. Lipopolysaccharides, histamine, mTOR, all stimulate PLA2. The adrenal glands make cortical steroids. Ginkgo biloba is an herb, curcumin, CDP choline, all inhibit PLA2. And what can happen is that when we have any of these, any of these uh, environmental factors, it'll stimulate the PLA2 to bring the arachidonic acid out. And then tumor necrosis factor can also stimulate the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. And we go down a pathway where we stimulate the TXA enzyme and make thromboxin A2. Now, we don't do this in our software yet, but when we come out with our new chip, uh, we want to make sure we have all the PLA2 enzymes because there might be some that are activated. We want to look at the COX-1 and 2. Um, this was an interesting one because this guy 
takes these inflammatory things and moves them over to make prostacyclin, which is actually vasodilative and inhibits the, uh, the uh, platelet aggregation. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that aspirin and your NSAIDs will actually encourage going over this direction. That's why some people take aspirin, although that's been now, you know, said not to because of bleeding, but just to show the action, aspirin will block coming down here to make the thromboxane A2. And again, then activate the platelets and stimulate the, uh, the rantes. We're not going to get into it today, but interestingly, collagen, epinephrine, and INOS and angiotensin 2 stimulate the platelets. But I find this interesting that uh, collagen plays a role in that. We need to, to dig into that uh, just a little bit uh, more. So here is the, uh, the importance of the adrenal glands to make the cortisol. And the adrenal glands also knock down the, uh, the histamine. So this is an important pathway. And that's why uh, you spoke earlier about doing those uh, blood tests, seeing where your arachidonic acid is, your arachidonic acid EPA. Those are all important markers to look at because that will be uh, pro-inflammatory. So here's a little information on that PLA2, phospholipase A2. It liberates arachidonic acid. And then that arachidonic acid makes prostaglandins and leukotrides. When rat platelets are incubated with phospholipase A2, thromboxane A2-like activity and prostaglandins are formed. Again, pro-inflammatory. Uh, right now, there aren't any tests for PLA2. I know Great Plains used to have it, uh, but they couldn't get the regent. And uh, I've talked to them and said, you guys got to get that back because it's so important to look at this uh, PLA2. All right, here's a quick overview. And this came from the, uh, the Great Plains website, Bill Shaw. And by the way, Bill Shaw was a, a pioneer. I mean, he was talking about PLA2 a long time ago. When experiencing infections, PLA2 can break down the phospholipids of the membranes of bacteria, fungus, and parasites. So I saw a recording here. Is a good thing? Yes. However, inflammation often becomes excessive. And then the same phospholipase that attacks infectious agents may attack the cell membranes, damage or killing those cells. Most common free fatty acid produced by this is arachidonic acid, which can increase the production of mediators of inflammation, which we spoke about, of the prostaglandins, leukotrienes. Superoxide anions could stimulate phospholipase A2. And we've spoken about this many times, particularly EMF is making more superoxide. If we don't take our oxidized glutathione back to the reduced superoxide. And if you remember when we spoke about the NOS uncoupling, what do we make? Superoxide. So I believe superoxide is public enemy number one. Now again, superoxide is helpful. It kills pathogens, but in excess of problem. So the products of this phospholipase A2 are membrane damaging agents and may be responsible for mitochondrial damage during oxidative stress. Um, here we're saying that a study of intestinal cells has shown the tumor necrosis act TNFA potentiates the release of arachidonic acid. So the more you have that uh, TNFA being upregulated by environmental factors or genetic upregulation, the more you're going to take that phospholipase A2 to stimulate the arachidonic acid release. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that thromboxane A2, A2, and this can be measured, stimulating the platelets, creating rantes. However, these activated platelets can also stimulate something called SCD40L. We're going to get into that just uh, a little bit. But before we do, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the Mediterranean diet has a lot of health benefits. Oleolic acid comes from your... Uh, from your olive oil, and that may stimulate this PGI2 enzyme to shunt this inflammatory thing over to prostacyclin, which is vasodilative and also inhibits platelet aggregation. So absolutely fascinating how we've been talking about the Mediterranean diet, the olive oil. We now know the pathway that that can, uh, can move through. 
So uh, I was blown away uh, by that one, Dr. Jill. Yeah, unbelievable. And I love olive oil. It's good for us, isn't it? It's <laughs> often with these pathways. And, you know, we do a lot of testing where, and the micronutrients and things, I see a surprising number of people who are deficient in oleanaic acid. Absolutely. And um, so if that's the case, a little bit of olive oil might certainly be beneficial. Okay, here's the thromboxin AT, A2. Prostaglandin counterbalances the thrombotic and vas vasoconstrictive properties of TXA2. This balance can become dysregulated in pathological and physiological situations. So increased activity of thromboxin A2 could be associated with mitochondrial or mitocardial infarction, stroke, arteriosclerosis, and bronchial asthma, pulmonary hypertension, kidney injury, hepatic injury, allergies, angiogenesis, and the growth of cancer cells. When activation of TX or thromboxin A2 is uncontrolled, there could be pathological consequences. I'm not going to read all of this, but the bottom line here is that activated platelets also express SCD40L. And now we're going to get into to that. Um, but first, again, mentioning serotonin. Serotonin is transported by the platelets and released upon activation. This induces constriction of injured blood vessels and enhances platelet aggregation to minimize the blood loss. Interestingly, platelets contain high amounts of serotonin and a dysfunction of the serotonin system is involved in the development of several behavior orders. So there may be, and this is just hypothetical, so we're not making any statements here, but it may be involved in depression, anxiety disorders, and self-aggressive disturbances. Uh, the platelets are able to take up dopamine and express various dopamine receptors, which could make them an interesting tool to study the underlying mechanisms of schizophrenia. Lots to learn here. Um, we're just in the very beginning stages of understanding this. Um, the platelets store large amounts of serotonin. They're released during the thrombus formation, and that creates the, uh, the clots. But what I found interesting it induces hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And if you have overabsorption of iron and you don't clear your hydrogen peroxide, you get hydroxyl radicals that are very pro-inflammatory. All right, SCD40L. Activated platelets are the major source of SCD40L, which has been implicated in platelet and leukocyte activation. Um, and this SCD40L is involved in inflammation and vascular diseases. So here's the activated platelets stimulating the SCD40L. Now, this is interesting. High early SCD40L levels in trauma patients reflect tissue injury, shock, coagulopathy, and um, adrenal activation and predict mortality. SCD40L may be involved in trauma-induced endothelial damage and the blood clotting. Now here's a chart when we get the activated platelets, SCD40L is activated, that increases VEGF. We'll talk about that in a little bit, encourages the growth of tumors. So that's why it's so important that we don't have this, uh, this elevated. I'm sure Dr. Joe, you measure uh, VEGF on occasion. Yeah, I was going to say, Bob, and there's some new with Dr. Patterson's research, we can now measure SCD40L with special labs as well. So literally, we're doing panels to look at all of these things now. Um, they're not easily accessible as far as lab requests, but they are available to be tested. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to hear you're doing that, uh, because I think we're going to find <clears throat> that the long haul COVID and possibly even the chronic Lyme disease has increased uh, grantees in SCD40L. Yes. I've been talking to the folks at ILADS about that. Hopefully we can do some, uh, some research. So these myeloid derived suppressor cells are relatively newly defined that they suppress immune responses. And there's a role of this in solid tumors. It's been extensively characterized as pro tumor in intensive clinical studies circulating and infiltrating uh, MDSCs at the tumor site were associated with poor prognosis in patients with solid tumors. In a study of breast cancer patients, the overall survival of preoperative patients with MDSC levels greater than one with stage four disease was significantly shorter 
compared to people that had lower than one of them. So what they're saying in this study is that MDSC levels could work as a good prognostic indicator, especially in those with advanced breast cancer. FEDGEF, that is the growth of new cells. I'm sorry, about new blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Is uh, that important? Sure. But what happens when someone gets cancer? They need those new blood vessels for it to grow. So they're saying that the inhibition of VEGF-induced angiogenesis significantly inhibits tumor growth. Angiogenesis is the, the growth of the new uh, blood vessels. You know what else, Bob, I'm seeing, as you mentioned, mold can in, uh, either decrease or increase VEGF, but also Bartonella, which you mentioned as an LPS inducer. Um, I see that commonly abnormal, um, abnormally high VEGF with Bartonella as well. Absolutely. Uh, this is exciting things that are, uh, that are happening here. Now, we did a whole uh, video on this. We called it the home cycle, where multiple, and let me just... Uh, Zoom in here a little bit. Multiple endogenous mediators like histamine, dopamine, angiotensin II, all of these will stimulate interleukin-6. Mold and mycotoxins, Lyme disease, lipopolysaccharides, EMF, stimulate interleukin-6. And when interleukin-6 gets stimulated, we get superoxide through NOx mast cells, histamine, Oh, and by the way, we talked about the heme oxygenase calms down the mast cells. Um, then histamine stimulates Rantes. Now, as we talked about in that video, superoxide mast cells and histamine stimulate the renin angiotensin system that will stimulate angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and the literature is there. Angiotensin 2 stimulates Rantes. So, this is where we spoke at length, that long interview about the importance of IL-6. Again, our friend, unless it's overactive. So yet another third way that we can make uh, too much Rantes. I'm not going to read this. These are the SNPs, the genetic mutations that could be involved when they're mutated that would allow this to be more proactive. And again, we, we showed this before, but again, because this makes the histamine, the mast cells create the histamine, the histamine enhances the production of Rantes. Mast cells showcase that the mast cells as an additional renin source. So interestingly, mast cells can stimulate that renin angiotensin system that's going to make more interleukin-6 and just keep things moving around. So mast cells could be targeted along with renin angiotensin system inhibitors to manage angiotensin II related dysfunctions. And uh, angiotensin II is aldosterone, which causes you to hold on to sodium and excrete potassium, and that's related to, uh, to blood pressure and uh, edema. Histamine and renin. Histamine has been shown to stimulate the release of henin, renin, and superoxide activates the, uh, the renin as well. So that's just backing up what we talked about. And here's the, uh, the peer-reviewed study. Not going to read it, but the bottom line is that you get this feedback loop when you have superoxide, mast cells, and histamine, and it just feeds upon itself an inflammatory cascade. When we did this video, we had no idea that the angiotensin II stimulated Rantes. And again, I'm not going to read this, but this is the Holmes hypothesis that uh, is related to toxic environmental factors, creating uh, these inflammatory agents, depleting our NADPH, stimulating the renin angiotensin system in that negative uh, or that positive feedback loop of inflammation. So again, if someone uh, is interested, watch our video number uh, Number uh, 42. And Bob, I've been, if you're listening here and if you're list, going to listen on, wherever you're listening, I will include these links. So just stay, if you don't worry about finding them, um, I'll make sure they're included. Oh, good, good. Yeah, when I, when I grabbed this, there was 2,900 people who watched it on YouTube. That's amazing. And Bob, I just looked, it's over 3,000 now. So it's all right. It's just, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Wow. Okay. All right. And here's the one on the Knox pathways where we explain that, uh, that home cycle. 
All right, now we're going to wrap up with the, uh, the omega-3s, resolvins, and protectins. So a meta-analysis revealed an association between your polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation and a reduction in platelet aggregation. High-risk patients with cardiovascular disease or diabetes could benefit from, uh, from the omega-3 therapy. Now, this is fascinating. Again, peer-reviewed study. Both EPA and DHA, this is the, the parts of your fish oils when you take them, get incorporated into platelet phospholipids at the expense of arachidonic acid, which may help reduce platelet aggregation via a reduction in the arachidonic acid-derived platelet uh, aggregating uh, pro pro uh, coagulant metabolites. EPA competes with AA for that COX enzyme, reducing its action on arachidonic acid. And it reduces the formation of that uh, thromboxane A2. EPA DHA also gets incorporated into neutrophils and red blood cells at the expense of linoleic acid and arachidonic acid. It decreases whole blood viscosity and increases red blood cell flexibility, thus likely reducing the risk of thrombosis. Now, what happens is they go through a couple of steps, and I'm going to show you a chart here in a couple moments, where we make what are called protectins and resolvins. And they're associated with various beneficial effects and the prevention of various diseases, modulates the immune system, helpful for autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. Interesting little chart here. When you get tissue injury, you get the acute inflammation. The lipoxins, resolvins, and protectins complete resolution. If not, you'll get abscesses and scars and chronic inflammation from the prostaglandins and leukotriene. So that's why these are so important to resolve complete resolution when we have the resolvins. Um, and that looks like a duplicate slide. Okay, so uh, now here's arachidonic acid, and it shows on this chart the different pathways, and we want to map this all out. Uh, genetically and epigenetically, we want to map this out, but you can see the arachidonic acid comes down and makes acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Interestingly, there's a couple of pathways that we've not identified yet. This might be a future show to talk about how we can get that arachidonic acid to come down to be actually helping the resolution of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So arachidonic acid isn't all bad, right. but your EPA and DHA, they go down these pathways and here's where you make their re, uh, resolvins and protectins. And the standard American diet that I think you alluded to earlier, we're much heavier in the omega sixes and the things that'll create the arachidonic acid Yes. Versus so the seed oil. Diet. So just for practical, if you're listening, seed oils, I would really avoid. Those are going to be sources, canola oil, all these oils that can um, become rancid and can produce more arachidonic acid. You want the omega-3s, which is your wild salmon, your fish. And bottom line is you should probably be taking a fish oil. And I like the ones, especially if you have this inflama inflammatory pathway, higher DHA and with SPMs. I actually put a link on this site to Mega Omega. There's other ones, but that one happens to have both EPA, DHA, and SPMs all in one. Wow, very impressive. Okay. Uh, this resolve in E1 is generated during resolution of inflammation in the human vasculature. And a study has shown new potent agonist-specific antiplatelet actions. Now this is a little confusing. Agonist means it helps the antiplatelet actions. These actions could underscore some of the beneficial actions of the EPA in uh, humans. I really like this chart. Uh, so here's your omega-6s. And from a genetic standpoint, uh, we are finding that there's enzymes called FADs, fatty acid desaturases. And they're involved with taking your omega-6s, the FADs too, down through to make arachidonic acid. But this is interesting. Omega-6s may use up the available FADS 2s. So when we consume our FADS 2s, they have to go through multiple steps. And this is a new one that we've just added, ELOVL2, finding it to be very significant. This is what takes your EPA into your DHA. 
so we can make the protections and resolvents. What we're observing, when people have a lot of mutations in their FADS1 and FADS2, they have unresolved inflammation. They just can't seem to get to the bottom of why they're in their mid-40s and they hurt all over. Uh, part of it could be that they're not getting down to these protectants and resolvents because they will inhibit the plated aggregation and the rantes. So we have this on our computers. We show this to folks all the time, why it's important that we get those omega-3s, but more importantly, that we get down through this way. And if we don't, we may need to use those protectants and resolvents to just bypass the weakness here. And Bob, I would tell you something really interesting. I showed you all my leg when it was severely cellulitic and probably from platelet aggregation. I did not know this pathway, but I'm pretty intuitive. And I, don't, I, I didn't at the time know why. I just knew they were anti-inflammatory. I took like four times the recommended dose of SPMs. And it really, really, those are the resolvents that you're talking about. I took very high doses of these and it really, really helped. And it's no wonder you're showing me the pathway for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here the study showing and uh, this was just published back in 2017, FADS and ELOVL2 may have a role in the differences in omega-3 requirements. So what we're finding is the more ELOVL2 mutations, the more there's a higher need for DHA. Mm -hmm. And here's the FADS1 and FADS2. So this one over here means mutation. And you can see this person had a mutation in every one of the FADS1, and they had mutations in most of the FADS2. The people that are really struggling, and we see them every once in a while, homozygous or both parents gave the mutation straight down through. And those are the folks that are really struggling in getting their EPA turned in DHA and making their protectants and resolvents. Uh, I would have to put this on my top 10 list of important genetic things to be aware of uh, because we find this really is involved with those who are uh, struggling. Um, and here's a um, peer-reviewed study. Our results suggest somebody wants to look it up. 953413 regulates your polyunsaturated fatty acids by altering ELOVL2 expression through the FOXO genes. And again, we're finding that one when combined with tumor necrosis factor, folks are in a lot of inflammation. Um, Here's a study, clinical studies in humans shows that marine omega-3s provide antiplatelets effect. Um, three grams of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids for four weeks lowered fibrinogen, thrombin, and factor V levels. Um, and we talked about this before, that uh, it's the expense of the arachidonic acid. EPA also competes with arachidonic acid for the COX enzymes, reducing its action on AA. If you remember, the COX enzymes are ones that bring it down and make the uh, thromboxane A2. So they're saying EPA both directly and indirectly reduces the formation of arachidonic acid, thromboxane A2, that activates the platelets. Now, here there's all kinds of uh, tests out there. This one just happens to come from Omega Quant. Uh, this was a uh, middle aged lady who got uh, COVID and was doing very poorly. Now, this was post COVID. But here's her omega-3 index, should be 8 to 12 percent, three and a half. Then here's the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s, should be 3.1 to 5.1 off the chart, 11.9. Arachidonic acid to EPA should be 2.5 to 11.1, 35 .1, again, off the chart. In my opinion, it's important that people know where this is. So uh, talk to your, uh, your physician, whoever that is, and uh, see if you can see where these are, because it's uh, more important than we ever, ever realized. And I mentioned earlier, but Bob, these are now available on your regular labs. So this is not a functional cash lab. You can get it through Quest or LabCorp or Boston Heart or some of these other labs um, are, it's available. Mm -hmm. Then here is the test for um, thromboxane. Same individual, the thromboxane should be less than 141, little high, moderately high, way too high, 421, 643. No wonder this person was, uh, was struggling in this case study. Uh, so this is the same person that had that uh, arachidonic acid. 
So the arachidonic acid was stimulating the thromboxane A2 and creating massive inflammation and fatigue and lots of, uh, of histamine. All right, so what's a potential action plan? And this is a uh, really short list. Uh, but a couple practical things you can do. Make sure you're in a mold-free environment. Clear mold if an issue. Uh, if you work with a functional medicine doctor, see if you have some mold inside you. Uh, if there's real concern, see a functional medicine person for heavy metals, glyphosate. Check for Lyme, Clostridia, lipopolysaccharides. Uh, consider eliminating high fructose corn syrup, but especially with the SIRT1 mutations. Uh, low histamine diet if uh, histamine is an issue. Check what we just talked about here. Maybe consider checking the thromboxane A2. Uh, as Dr. Jill mentioned, they're, uh, they're not easy to get, but you can measure RANTES, SCD, 40L, VEGF, TNF, alpha, IL6. Dr. Jill, are you doing what are considered the long haul panels? Is that what you're doing? That's exactly what I'm doing, correct. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you want, you can do your genomic resource test if you want to see if there's any mutations that may worsen the, the situation. Um, so that's it, other than just a brief commercial to health professionals. If you're a health professional and you'd like to look at all this, we have a genetic test called Your Functional Genomics. Um, the software analyzes everything for you and puts it together. And we also have uh, online education. If you're a health professional, you want to try the certification course, um, here's where you go, nutrigeneticresearch.talonlms.com. And you can save $100 with uh, using the coupon code Dr. Jill. And uh, it's not for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. But for somebody who really wants to dig in and study, it's a, a good resource for you. If anyone wants to contact our clinic, tolhealth.com, there's our phone number, 717-733-2003. The software, if you're a health professional, you want to try a, uh, a free trial, there's the website, functionalgenomicanalysis.com. Yvonne Lucchese and Chrissy Bannon are your helpers. And uh, we have a whole line of nutrients that support the function, freedomtoformulate.com. Uh, so we just went through uh, probably a three-day course in uh, an hour, an hour and a half, but uh, there it is. Um, as always, it is so fun. And for those of you who stayed with us the whole time, a lot of you did. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I know someone commented, I'm glued to my seat. So I know not, <laughs> this is not for everyone, but for those of you who enjoy the pathways and understanding, and I would just encourage if you're a patient listening, you're overwhelmed by this, that's okay. Sometimes we're overwhelmed too, but uh, get a functional doctor, get, you know, you can do the testing um, with Bob's companies that he just put up there with your doctor. And, you know, there's lots and lots of solutions out there. I'm just excited, Bob, like we said in the beginning to bring what we're talking about. A lot of the stuff we're talking about, we see this in clinical practice. We don't yet have hundreds of thousands of people in randomized controlled trials, but this is where science starts, right? We ask the questions, we look at pathways and we make hypotheses. And that's where you're on the leading edge. And I couldn't be more honored to be here with you. So thank you again for sharing. Well, thank you for allowing us the, the platform here to uh, to bring this out because it wasn't for you. We'd be sitting here having fun by ourselves <laughs> and not sharing it with anyone. So uh, okay. really appreciate your, your openness to uh, to bring this out. So uh, you're, you're a pioneer yourself in the work you're doing and, uh, and hopefully the hand, hand reaction will be well known and uh, it's going to help <laughs> a lot of people. If I, if I can go through something to help people, I'm all good with it, like my leg and everything else. So thank you all for listening today. Um, we will be back again, so stay tuned.